this is Brother Aiden with ChristianInterviews.com. I have a very special guest today, a unique guest, a different guest. I think you're going to like him, him a lot. And as you know, we give away these interviews for free to build the body of Christ worldwide. I'd like to introduce Perry Marshall. Um, some of you do know him, some of you don't, so I'll brag on Perry a little bit first. Uh, he's not a pastor uh, or missionary like most of my guests. He is a successful Christian businessman. He's written several books. Um, I've read a couple of them on marketing and advertising. They're very good. So I'll let him share a little bit of his background real quick, and then we'll dive right into it. How are you, Perry? I'm great. It's a really honor, a big honor to be here. And, you know, you, you've got very distinguished guests from mostly different walks of life than me, and I, I really appreciate what they do. So it's, it's really special to be here. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for taking the time. So... Um, Real quick, just so the business people know know who you are, or the non-business people, uh, which books uh, have you written, and and where do you live, and uh, what's your testimony? Uh, I'm from Chicago. Um, I'm known for uh, a book called The Ultimate Guide to Google Advertising, which is the uh, best-selling book on internet advertising and in in the book world, um, and also Ultimate Guide to Facebook Advertising, and then another book called Eighty Twenty Sales and Marketing. And um, I'm actually a pastor's kid. I became a Christian when I was four. Um, and I remember I, I, I was out outside one night, and it was dark, and I just looked in the stars, and I just remember having this kind of palpable sensation like, you know, uh, that guy that Mrs. Alms, the Sunday school teacher, talks about, he put all that stuff up there. It was just this realization um, and, uh, so, you know, I, I, I grew up a Christian family and everything like that. Um, I, I would say my dad didn't really have a business bone in his body. He was like a ministry guy through and through, but I, I just always felt drawn to the business world. And, um, you know, and I would also say, you know, I, I have a very intellectual bent. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, it, it comes out in all the different stuff that I do, and so direct marketing actually makes a lot of sense for a person like me because it's very rigorous, and that also brings an intellectual bent to uh, the way that I share the gospel um, and how I think about faith. So there's a lot of stuff we could talk about here. That's that's what I'm excited about, and. Just so everybody knows, and we'll post these on my website, Perry's two sites are that are not business-related are coffeehousetheology.com, which I read for at least a couple of hours uh, this last few months, which is great, and cosmicfingerprints.com. And um, so we're gonna, well, I am going to ask you a business question, but I'll, I'll wait for a little bit later. But first, let's start off with this. What are, you'd say, the, the biggest points for the Coffee House Theology site, the Cosmic Fingerprint site, that kind of sets it apart from Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel uh, or those other apologetic guys that I like their books and, and that you know either Christians aren't aware of that we have this extra ammunition to defend our faith. And sometimes we have unsaved you know, people that listen to these interviews that they might go, wow, you know, I never realized that before. Um, well, so... You know, I, I respect all the guys that you're referring to. I I would say that um, oftentimes I feel like those guys, or not really the, them in particular, but I, I guess a lot of people in the apologetics world uh, are playing softball instead of hardball. Um, and I also, I, I hate the word apologetics. I, uh, uh, I'm not apologizing for anything. Um, I, th I think a, I think a better word um, I would uh, I would I would call myself an advocate of uh, that faith is rational. Um, it, it, it is it is philosophically and logically necessary for everybody to operate on a set of assumptions, and nobody gets to have a set of assumptions that are not arrived at. Uh, without some form of faith, okay? Um, if you believe that the universe popped out of nothing for no reason at all, that is faith, okay? Um, if you believe that there's a, a prime mover, an infinite force outside of the universe, uh, that's faith, too. Um, you, you're you're going 
you're going to have some kind of faith. It's, it's just a question of, of what makes the most sense. So I guess the story behind those two sites, so Coffeehouse Theology is kind of as the name implies, and Cosmic Fingerprints is definitely on the science side. Um, you know, uh, my, my younger brother went from being a Christian missionary in China to almost an atheist in the space of four years. And wow. he's absolutely one of the smartest people I know. And he has a real gift for asking penetrating questions. And I just felt he was asking questions deeper than, than anybody else had pushed me with. And I already done a lot of, of stuff like this before. And he was dragging me with him. And um, and the long story short is those sites grew out of my frustration with the current stuff that was out there. Um, in, in particular, the, cos the Cosmic Fingerprint site. And um, the, the Cosmic Fingerprint site um, attacks the, the questions of biology from the standpoint of an electrical engineer. And the, the really short version is um, Brian started asking me all these questions about you know evolution and all this kind of stuff. And I had never dug into it. And suddenly, I, I felt that I had to. And I just floundered helplessly for quite a while. Um, I, I, did not, I did not find the books most of the books and things on the topic to be satisfying. I, I found gaps in, and omissions in all of them. I, I was disappointed. And I ended up like buying 100 books and reading several hundred scientific papers. And um, but I had a big epiphany when I realized that um, everything in genetics had a parallel in information technology. Uh, in 2002, I wrote another book called Industrial Ethernet. Ethernet's, you know, the wire that, that, that your Internet comes through. And it was all about how the, the packets of information are, are assembled and sent across the wire. And I suddenly realized that the data structures in DNA were eerily, eerily similar. And that if you worked the argument down to the, its foundations, you had in the genetic code in indisputable um, evidence of design. Um, nothing like it exists in nature outside of living things, like not even close. Um, and, you know, maybe that means the universe is intelligent en enough to give birth to life. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a creator stuck his finger in and, and created a miracle. But either way, it it tells a story that no atheist would ever be comfortable with. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of things that you just don't learn about. Um, I like but, your titles here. i got to interrupt you. So I want people sure. to really look at the sites. On Cosmic Fingerprints, it says, New Scientific Evidence for Existence of God, Seven yes. Great Lies of Organized Religion, yeah. Origin of Information Challenge. If you can read this, I can prove God exists. That's yes. an interesting, a great one. And then Atheist Riddles versus Atheist Blogging. You know, atheists are very bold, and, and they'll challenge. So my challenge, I guess, would be to both Christians and non-Christians is go read Perry's site, and you'll be floored. I mean, I mean I've mean, i read the Josh McDowell books. I've read the Luke Strobel, and I like Perry's stuff more. That's why I'm interviewing Perry today. So, <laughs> I mean, this is some good stuff. The atheists really do play hardball, and everything on that site um, it, it comes from walking into the atheist forums and debating with atheists and backing them into a corner 100% of the time. Um, in fact, there, there was a radio program, and I won't tell you the name of it, but I was invited onto a radio program a few years ago, and then the host had to cancel it because he couldn't find anyone who would debate me. Um, in, in the sort of inner ring of the atheist circles, they all know who I am. And I'm not saying that to beat my chest. What, the reason I'm saying that is when you go to the site and you read the stuff, it is very well researched and it is rock solid. And if you un if you understand the positions that I take, you'll be unassailable. And yeah. you know that's what that's what you want. 
Uh, and Christianity really does stand up to the scrutiny that that it should. Yeah, Paul said, "Have an answer for the hope that's within you," and um, it's definitely not not blind faith. I mean, I was a philosophy major before I got saved at 21. So this oh, is, awesome! This is, right, this is this is right up my alleyway. Oh, that's I wasn't, great. I wasn't raised in the church, and then my heart got changed, and I said, "Well, I need some information for my mind." So that's why I read Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel. So this well, is, I already this is like great. you. Hey, we, well, we've known each other three or four years now, Perry. Come on. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, tongue in cheek. <laughs> I know. So, copy osteology. So, this one I'm thinking is more for um, my wife might like this site more than the other one, I guess. Or, or yeah, or it's not so much for the geek. I think what it's really for, quite honestly, is so it's for geeks. the per- <laughs> it's, it's it's for it's for the person who uh, has been wounded by religion. Yes, you know, a lot of and, people. And, you know, speaking of atheists, I, most atheists that I've ever met are people who've been wounded by religion, and the things that have ha- happened to them are very sad and unfortunate. Okay? Yeah. And it's not usually just like, well, you know, they prayed for Grandpa to survive cancer and Grandpa died. It's usually, you know, I mean, some of the things that people do to people, say to people... Um, we don't need to repeat all the horror stories, but we both have we both heard a lot of them, I'm sure. So the site is for that person. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just watched that movie the other day called God's Not Dead. Not as deep as your site, but a great movie for anybody if you haven't seen it yet, Perry. It's a, it's, a, it's an inter- I did see it. I did yeah, see I it. Um, it. So yeah, so, um, they 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 did a better job with that than I expected, actually. Um, so. You know, um, some sometimes sometimes Christian efforts can you know sometimes they're a little weird, and that, they did, they did a good job with the plot on that. Yeah, yeah, it didn't backfire like many Christian movies do backfire. <laughs> Put it that way. So what what give some ammunition? One or two things that something like uh, my wife could use. That's that's uh, I am a geek, so that's okay. I'll admit that. Um, that um, you know somebody could use that doesn't get real technical. It's yeah, it's a kind of a powerful thing. One or two things that's on your site. You know, on the on the Coffeehouse Theology site, there is an article by Anne Rice, uh, which I got her permission to use, um, and she is a pretty famous fiction author. She's written a lot of like horror fiction, and but it's all historical fiction, and she's very famous for the meticulous historical accuracy of her novels. And she eventually reached a point in her career where she she wanted to tackle New Testament kind of stuff. And she really had no idea what what she was going to discover. She had left the Catholic Church at 18 and become an atheist, and she had been that way most of her life. And she started researching Jesus. And on this article on my site, she explains... You know, so she buys a truckload of books and just starts digging in, and she starts making this discovery about the historical Jesus. Um, And, you know, coming as close as you hopefully can get to a not really having a predisposition one way or uh, another to what she was going to discover. And it is a really interesting article, and it makes some very powerful observations. And I think her most powerful observation is she makes a case that there's no way that the Gospels were written after the fall of Jerusalem. Historically, it makes no sense for them to be written the way that that they are written. Um, In other words, it would be like if... If somebody living in Hiroshima in 1950 barely, barely made any reference to an atomic bomb going off, ah, uh, yeah, good analogy. Okay, so go, you know, go read that article. I think anybody would find that, you know, anybody that like start there, and the rabbit hole just gets fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that is that's a great article. So let's shift gears here. Business and Christian, um, um, obviously you and I find a way to mesh those two together and do it ethically and morally. What advice uh, would you have for the Christian businessmen that listen or marketers that listen? Um, well, tying, you know, in, tying into the principles of Jesus, of course. You know, you know um, I, I grew up in what I might call 
the sackcloth and ashes crowd. Um, it's kind of this attitude that is an extreme distrust of financial success, um, kind of this uh, unstated um, intimation that the highest calling you can have in life is to be a full-time minister and everything else is sort of second class. And nobody would actually come out and say that. I don't give you the wrong idea. But somehow or another, you always felt that way. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? I, I disagree. Um, I disagree too, Perry. <laughs> if, if you <laughs> – I'm sure you do. And God bless you for disagreeing. I think – well, I'm um, on your page. I disagree with the sackcloth and ashes guys. <laughs> <laughs> people, I'm on your side. <laughs> kingdom people who work in the marketplace have so much capacity to influence culture, especially when you, you, you manage a workplace and you own a company, if you're any kind of author, subject matter expert, authority, then the books you write or the, the blogs or the emails or the social media that you do, um, all of that is very powerful. And, you know, we have so many examples from Scripture of people like, you know, Daniel was a respected a revered man in Babylon. Yes. Revered. Like, hey, what's that writing on the wall? You know, there is a guy that could tell us what that means. Go get him now, right? Yes. Okay. And as a Christian, you want to be that person. And, of course, you don't become that person without, you know, maybe ending up in the lion's den every once in a while. And, you know, Daniel had a whole journey that he had to go on, but... I, I think that is that is the kind of legacy we should aspire to, or Joseph in Egypt, or you, you know, you, you, it's easy to forget David was a priest, but he, that wasn't like job number one. Job number one is military commander, king, you know, p uh, political figure. Same with Solomon, and you know, those are. You know, the, the, those are jobs today no less than they were then, you know, even if, you know, okay, it's not a theocracy. We do live in a democracy. But, you know, Christians should occupy influential places in the world and not shrink back and not be afraid to wield power. And I don't mean, you know, grabbing for it in you know, some selfish way, but carrying it and wearing it responsibly. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. We're made kings and priests unto our God. Yes. And many people understand the priest side, the preacher side, but not the not the king side. And, you know, Old Testament, there was 12, 12 uh, 11 of them for each priest. So, you know, more, more kings to help fund missionaries and orphans and things that we believe in and help with. So uh, I read one of your articles a little bit back. It was awesome. I loved it. It was fascinating. I just came back from India, so I saw what you saw, and I've mm. seen it in the States, and that is healing miracles. Now, <laughs> I always yes. say that's second to salvation. I preach salvation first when I preach, and miracles is a bonus, so it's secondary. And then I've seen it with my own eyes, and I, and I saw that you saw that, and I was so excited. And I said, let's talk to Perry about that for a minute. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, you know, I for years I was decidedly neutral on the subject. And, and I'm thankful that I was because I just hadn't seen enough to judge. I had some charismatic friends, and they would kind of make their argument. And I wasn't really sure what I thought. I grew up in an argu in a environment that was anti-charismatic. Like, in fact, one, one, one some managed to sneak in and do a concert, and in the middle of it he was – talking about uh, a deliverance that somebody did on his mother, and they said, oh, we've had enough of you. Uh, and they said, we are never inviting you back. So, like, so I've kind of, you know, I've lived in the anti-world, and I've lived in the don't ask, don't tell world. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, now having seen what I have seen, I have, I have seen deaf people here. Uh, here. I've, I've seen that twice now. Okay, I've seen, a, you know, not maybe hundreds, but certainly dozens. I, you know, there's lots of stuff that I have seen, and I have lots of documentation. In fact, co coffeehousetheology.com slash miracles is like 
kind of my chronicle of, of, of what I have seen. I think that cessationism, the position that miracles ceased after the disciples, it is not only not biblical, okay, there is no good biblical argument. Uh, you know, you can go read them, they're all flimsy. Yes, they are. It's heretical. It, it is, is It is contrary to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the whole entire Old Testament. I know Christians who insist God never talks to people today. That is heretical. Yeah, Hebrews okay. thirteen eight. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's that's right. And 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 quite honestly, some of the people that take the cessationist position, I fear, are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And yeah. and and I'll tell you, um, you know what I see happening in the church, and I see it crossing all kinds of lines. It's not in any one particular place. I see a resurgence of the church beginning to to take back authority to heal people, to prophesy over people, to for people to live in the Spirit in a way that many of our parents and grandparents would have never imagined. And it yeah. is really, really exciting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've, I haven't functioned in all nine gifts of the Spirit, but I've functioned in a few of them, and it's, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's as he wills. That's the key, as he wills. So... Yeah. The problem is I think American church kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater when they had a few kind of wild evangelists that may have been over the line or whatnot. I don't sure. you know, I don't know, you know, each situation, but you know, when you when you've seen it with your own eyes and then you realize the word of God is good for your salvation, well then it's good for healing too. So that was that's a great article. So it's copyhousetheology.com forward slash miracles. I've got I believe three or four minutes or two minutes left. So any last yeah. thoughts you want to share with the uh, uh listeners here? Well, you know, um, just a really quick story. Um, ten years ago, I was in Kenya, and uh, and th- this I, I was visiting all these AIDS orphans, and I asked about microloans, and somebody took me to see this guy who'd start a business on a microloan, and he was a cobbler. He ran a cobbler shop. Ironically, he was crippled, so he's sitting there. Uh, against the wall with his crutches, uh, against the wall, and he was fixing shoes. And I'm talking to him through the translator. I noticed that he, unlike most people in Africa who kind of have this dull, worn-out, glassy look in their eyes, he was he was looking him in the eye, and he was sharp and alert, and he was proud of what he was doing, and his kids were, you know, his kids had uniforms for school, and they had enough to eat, and they had books for school, and and there's a line of people um, at, at his shop, and I suddenly had this epiphany, and the epiphany was, you know what, relief work is great, and missionaries are great, and churches are great, and schools are great, but if you don't have entrepreneurs, yep. nobody can pay for any of this stuff. The foundation of America. Yeah, well, and it's and not it goes back before you know Abraham was an entrepreneur and yes, Joseph was. was an entrepreneur, you know, and and I mean look look at the people you respect in the Bible and Paul ran this, you know, kick butt yes. tent making business and <laughs> Jesus <laughs> was a carpenter. That description, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and and sometimes we don't know a great deal about their businesses, but other times we do. But you know, it is. It is not normal for for people of renown in the Bible to be these weak people walking around with their hand out needing somebody to give them money. They they are self sufficient, happening people. You know, and entrepreneurship is a it's a calling. It is a valuable thing. You know, and so nobody should shrink back from it. And you know, if you're a Christian, you'll have a lot of stuff that you've got to sort out. So go sort it out. Do not shrink back from it. And do not face mediocrity. So Some listeners don't know what microloans are, though. <laughs> Can you hang on a second? I need to pick up, uh, put somebody in hold. Hang on. Sure. So listeners, microloans are where somebody will loan maybe 20 bucks or 100 bucks to an entrepreneur in another country, and there are Christian Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's fine. So we can uh, wrap up a couple minutes here. Go ahead. I'll let you do the talking on the wrap-up. On, on microloans? 
microloans and how they and how they help because I think some listeners don't know what they are. Yeah, so and what, and what you saw with your own eyes and so th- this guy had started a cobbler shop with a hundred dollar loan. And microloans have just exploded across the world, and you know Kiva does a version of that. And uh, but they're basically, you know, the the bottom billion people in the world lives on like a couple dollars a day or less, and a lot of times they are stuck in poverty because they just like they just can't get enough momentum. They can't. They can't build up some inventory. They can't buy their supplies at a reasonable price. They are being extorted by this person or that person, a property owner, a landowner, or a factory, or somebody. And microloans give people just enough uh, of a push and a start to lift themselves out. And the, the repayment rates of microloans are very high. And some of these organizations have very interesting mechanisms to get an entire village to take responsibility for a loan instead of just a person. And so if the person defaults, other people in the village will step in. And there's, So there's this built-in accountability. You know? And so there is a place for you know, loaning people uh, money to do things like this, uh, for teaching them business skills. A lot of times they already have some good skills, but they just need some help. You know, and like... What a great thing. What a fun thing for Christians to be doing. Is there a Christian microloan site you recommend or just tell people to Google it? Um, you, you're probably on your own with that. I, I don't know, you know, the best place to point you. Um, but, you know, however you work or whoever you work with, you know, it's, a, it's just a great thing for, you know, set aside some money and start, you know, start seeing what it does because it's a great, great thing. Great. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, listeners, please check out the sites. I think they'll bless you and help you. And uh, we'll talk later, Perry. Well, Aiden, thank you for giving your time today. Hopefully we can do this again. And, and I just really appreciate what you're doing. And, you know, let's catch up, okay? Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.